All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Why Ball Starters podcast. Um, unfortunately, John could not be here tonight, but Kendall and I are joined again by Justin Reed of the Spokesman Review. How are you doing tonight, Justin? Not too bad. Thanks again, guys, for having me on. We'll uh, talk some college basketball here. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, well, like Justin mentioned, we'll talk about uh, Gonzaga today. Um, a pretty historic run for the Zags this year that um, they got one game away from being the first uh, program since 1976 to win the national championship uh, or to have a perfect season, I should say, um, falling to Baylor 86 to 70. Um, Justin, I'm curious as a guy who covers the team, what some of your favorite storylines were this season, excluding, oh, Gonzaga might go undefeated. Right. Yeah. That, that whole storyline was, was pretty nice uh, to follow throughout the entire process. You know, it became very apparent after the non-conference schedule that, hey, you know, these guys have a chance to, to do something here. Uh, just watching the way they were, they were dominating teams uh, heading into conference play. So yeah, outside of, of that storyline, um, I mean, you got, you got to start with, with the guy who, who made this team tick and watching Jalen Suggs both on the court uh, as well as his media responses and the way he interacted with uh, his teammates and warmups. And I mean, just everything that, he meant to that program was was really fun to watch it was fun to watch him grow um outside of of course all the stories that i wrote you know there's a a, you know i have some other fun fun storylines that i that i like but um i'd say also um just the watching the national media slowly come around to this idea that gu is a very special program um in terms of what it's doing is unprecedented in in college basketball in the sense that you know college basketball at a, at a time obviously it's it's grown and new teams have slotted in but those new teams that have slotted in uh, either have a ton of financial backing or other sports athletic programs that are you know carrying it to to greatness uh gu didn't have that uh gu at the uh almost the turn of the century a few years before the turn of the century uh was I'm sure you and, and a lot of people already read about this because this was a, a very popular storyline uh, throughout the tournament, but just their, how decimated they were with, with financials that they really needed uh, something to kind of pull them out of this, you know, seemingly pretty brutal hole from um, all intents and purposes. And so uh, I think that storyline was really fun seeing the media realize that GU is, is yes, a basketball program, but in reality, is the only reason why Gonzaga exi- exists the way that it does today uh, with all of the NCAA Division I programs that it has and a, a pretty successful athletic uh, department, really, in the, in the grand scheme of things for such a small university. Uh, the track team, uh, the cross-country team um, does well all the time. Uh, the baseball team has made it to the NCAA tournament, I want to say, f- at least four, five times in the last 10 years. I'd, I'd, I'd want to say it's maybe a couple more times. Um, women's basketball team's obviously taken off, and uh, a lot of that has to do with um, just what GU basketball, men's basketball has meant uh, to that school. It's really, really allowed the university to, to do whatever it wants, um, just the financial backing of donors as well as the, uh, the amount of kids it, it brings to, to Spokane as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and kind of going into the national title game a little bit, um, you know, of course we're talking about the one time Gonzaga lost this year, but, um, it seemed from watching it. So I remember even when you came on our podcast earlier, but just kind of a storyline, both that we had ongoing on the podcast and, um, just other media as well, the, the talk about, okay, what kind of team can beat Gonzaga? And the talk was always that really physical and big team. Mm-hmm. like you saw with the West Virginia and what it turned out to be was not necessarily the, the size, but right. just the pure athleticism and intensity that Baylor played with. Exactly. You know, there were, there was, uh, I saw a few tweets um, from people talking about how Baylor's size and length got to GU. And I don't think that's, that's it at all. Uh, what it was, was a, a ferocious intensity uh, coupled with with that elite athleticism you were talking about, uh, not the most. You know, we're we're looking at this. You know, 
GU is is probably the the smoother of the two teams. You know, the more fundamental kind of classic motion, easy on the eyes. Uh, Baylor now their defense allows them to do that. Their defense allows them uh, to go kind of crazy on the defensive end, and that leads to some nice looking basketball on the offensive end um, because it just you you knock teams around a little bit and they get kind of rattled and frazzled. And I think that's what you saw what happened. Um, but yeah, GU came into this game, I thought matching up pretty well, you know, they, they, they match the size actually one through five GU has more size than Baylor did. Um, I thought that their athleticism at the guard position would be fine. I thought, you know, Suggs obviously wasn't going to have a problem. I thought Nemhard was going to hold up a little bit better than he did. He seemed a little sloppy, uh, a little careless, um, a little twitchy almost, but not a good kind of twitchy. Uh, and then Ayayi just seemed to step behind. Um, Ayayi's a good athlete. He's not the quickest. He's fast. He can, he can you know, hang up with the best of them. Uh, but Baylor has elite quickness. And again, they're not the, it's not so much speed either. It's literally just quickness. I mean, they'll, they're, they're on you. They're moving their feet. Uh, they have quick hands that, you know, we're looking at some of these plays that happen. One that, one that stood out to me a lot um, was a play. It was a fast break and Davian Mitchell somehow got back. And I don't remember who went up with it. Um, well, probably Suggs, but anyway, he you know he kind of swiped down at the ball. He got most most of that was 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 arm. Uh, in real time, it didn't look like that because they're just so fast. And I, I honestly think the officials' point of view and perspective makes it hard to really see that. So I think not not saying that they play dirty or anything like that, but I think they're so quick that it'll it allows them to play so aggressive uh, that it just really frustrates opponents and really gets in their head and, and caused specifically GU uh, to second guess themselves uh, to run a slower offense, to not move as much, to not dribble drive as much. I mean, literally the entirety of what GU wants to do on offense was affected by, by Baylor's just, like I mentioned, it's just aggressive defense. Yeah. Um, I think it, you kind of going off the the quickness of them. I don't see many college teams who use their hands so much like Baylor does. And right. that's one thing that I found really interesting about them through their whole tournament run and mm -hmm. just watching them even in season is the fact that they do, they swipe down all the time and usually that gets called. And that's what surprised me, especially in the Gonzaga game, because they did the exact same thing. Like you mentioned, they're swiping, they're poking, they're always getting right up in your grill the whole time. Right. And it's, it, I get. I mean, it speaks a lot to the coaching that they've coached them up to do that without being called for fouls. But I oh, yeah. guess what what adjustments could have Gonzaga made coming out of the gate because they just came out so slow, so sloppy yeah. on offense, turning the ball over. I mean, Baylor was hot too, which didn't help. But what could have Gonzaga done to work with that and not get down by nineteen early? There's, there's two thoughts that I have to that. The first, uh, I'll, I'll use kind of a soccer reference. So, you know, you, you look at a, at a team that likes to press, uh, likes to press the ball and, and win it back and, you know, just stay right on top of you. That doesn't happen for 90 minutes in, in any league. It's just it physically can't be done. You can't full-on press teams for 90 minutes. Uh, I didn't think Baylor could play like that for 40 minutes. And uh, I was wrong, obviously. I mean, they, they played – from minute one to minute 40 in the exact same sort of intensity. So that surprised me uh, as far as coming out differently. Um, you just can't practice that, you know, one, th another comparison I want to make uh, is the, uh, how offenses have to prepare for now Lumen field in Seattle. Um, you can't replicate that sort of noise and that sort of, of factor. You know, the coaches always talk about bringing speakers and just cranking music so you can barely hear, but it's, it's not the same. Um, and so no matter what you do in practice, how do you replicate a defense that nobody else really plays? You know, West Virginia of, of late, you know, they didn't really have a, a very good defense comparatively uh, to past years, but that West Virginia game that GU had in 2017 on their previous national championship run was very similar. You know, they were in your face. Uh, they, they swiped, they turned you over, they frustrated you. Um, you know, Suggs is a very composed player. Nebhard is a very composed player. But the what Nigel Williams-Goss meant to that 2017 team, because he, he provided athleticism, length, as well as leadership uh, and a willingness to be able – 
to just calm the situation down. And you just never felt like, even with Suggs or Nemhard, uh, that the team was calm, that they were ready to play. They were ready to attack. I uh, just felt like they were a little wild with everything that they did. So I think a big portion of it is you just, you can't, you can't prep for it. Uh, you know, if you switch to a two, three uh, on defense, he switched to a one, three, one. He did a little full court, three quarter court press. Uh, the offense tried to run a couple different sets rather than just their normal motion uh, that adjusts just based on what they see. I mean, I, I think they tried a lot. I think, I think, few just tossed you know essentially was was looking at a dartboard here and and took a bunch of shots and hoped one of them stuck and unfortunately uh none of them stuck long enough you know there were a couple stretches where you thought they were gonna get back into it even in the second half they were down by like 11 and you just felt like they were on that verge of being able to break through missed a couple free throws missed a couple lay-ins had a couple soft fouls and it's you know it's like okay well we're back at 15 again and there goes that little bit of momentum um that they had you know going into half they were down by 10 I'm like that's fine by me. You know, we're not, we haven't really been in this position outside of the BYU game. Um, let's, let's see what happens. And I was, I was decently confident and every single time GU tried to do anything, it just felt like Baylor answered and they answered strongly, uh, not allowing GU to continue any of that momentum, essentially having to start from scratch every single time. Yeah. And Gonzaga not being able to hit any three pointers either right. until later in the second half that did mm -hmm. not help their comeback efforts at all. Um, no. Do you think UCLA might've exposed Gonzaga's defense? Because I felt really good about Gonzaga winning the championship up until the UCLA game. And I know Juzang and Cody Riley out of all the players were making right. shots on the, mm -hmm. in that game and they're making long two range shots. I think it was Drew. Didn't you say they shot like 80% from long two point range in that game? UCLA. It was at one point UCLA was 14 of 19 from long two, I know. And yeah. it seemed like they didn't miss after I saw that stat. So, right. yeah. 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 It's, but it, do you, yeah. As, as far as, yeah, as far as how the defense looked, I think a, GU, um, they're, they're designed to not give up threes. Um, they're they're fine to give up those mid mid rangers, and we saw that a lot. We saw that uh, with Riley. Uh, we saw that uh, with Ju Zhang. We saw that. I mean, anyone on Baylor essentially. Teague found that soft spot in the middle every single time. Um, I think you just take your, your chances. Essentially, you know, say beat us from three, and Baylor. I mean, beat us from two. And what happened is Baylor. Mid G wasn't playing bad defense on the perimeter. Um, Baylor was making a lot of, of decently contested shots. And what was happening is Baylor, for what, I don't know how they did it because GU all season has done a, a pretty good job at rotating on defense actually. Um, and, and, and defending that three point line. And, and for whatever reason, Baylor uh, didn't, they didn't miss their shots when they were contested and then they made their shots that, that they manufactured to be open. And so I think it was a, I think it was more so good offense, more so than bad defense. You know, GU still finished with the 11th uh, most efficient defense in the country. That's down a couple spots from before that Baylor game. Uh, and I think the issue was teams were making shots. I mean, they were really making shots. UCLA was so frustrating because it felt like they were working so hard to score and it didn't matter. Like, it's almost like that's what they, what they wanted to do and they nailed it. And so that was really frustrating. Uh, Baylor more so was a little bit worse defense. Uh, rotations were slow and GU just looked slow. And I don't know if that's, you know, um, less recovery time. Uh, maybe they're just more beat up for whatever reason. There's no, there's no excuses as to why they looked that slow, but you know, you, you just wish that you could find a reason why, because they, they definitely looked a step slower the entire night against Baylor and, and yeah. Baylor's quick, Baylor's fast. But GU's not that slow. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you think that – me and Drew were kind of debating this before we came on the show today. But do you, do you think that being in the WCC is going to be a hindrance to Gonzaga long-term being able to win these type of games? Not just even this championship necessarily, but now we've seen them go out against a physical team like Baylor, a physical mm -hmm. team like Texas Tech, a physical team like North Carolina, Florida State. I mean, the list kind of goes on, and it seems to be – Maybe not the personnel is the same, but it does seem to be that good defenses and those quicker teams do seem to be Gonzaga's downfall um, every year. And that's not something that, like you said, you can't replicate that in the WCC. 
Right. And I, and, and I, I understand the takes about the West Coast Conference. Um, my, my first thought on that, and, and this is, you know, it's just the way that it is, you know, GU just can't go anywhere else. Uh, yeah. The Pac-12, they don't have a football team. Uh, right. You know, they talk about the Big East, and that's just ge- geographically doesn't make sense. Um, they've looked at the Mountain West. The Mountain West really hasn't been all that much. Actually, I, I think the Mountain West has actually been worse than, than the WCC the last yeah, probably. probably two years. Uh, <laughs> I agree. So it's, it's really weird. It's, it's very, very weird how, how that has has transpired, you know, with Nevada and San Diego State being in there. But um, it doesn't help, that's for sure. You know, the West Coast Conference – is getting better though. If you, if you look at back in 2005, let's just go back to then um, the quality of teams. I mean, imagine GU playing the 2005 West coast conference. Uh, I mean, they, they go undefeated every single year uh, this time around, you know, BYU was a battle and BYU going into the tournament was a, was uh 20, 26th in efficiency in the country. Um, you know, St. Mary's usually is, is hanging around the top 25. They had a down year. They should be back up next year, but um do I think it? I don't think it hurts, but I don't think it helps. I think it. Uh, I think the level of players GU has been able to recruit, um, and actually, you know, it's only going to get better as, as well. Um, but the, the level of players GU was able to see, they're, they're going to be able to recruit guys like Andrew Nembard out of high school consistently rather than having to wait for him to go play at Florida for two years. Um, they're going to be able to get. Uh, you know, they're getting Hunter Salas next year, who's also going to be a, an uber athletic guard. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the conference mm-hmm. to kind of answer the question, I don't think the conference helps, but I also don't think it hurts. Uh, I think if you're a good team, you're a good team. And if you have good coaching, uh, you have good coaching. And if you want it bad enough, uh, you're not going to let Baylor make you look slow is, is kind of my thinking on that. Yeah. Yeah. Where going back to that UCLA game, um, what was crazy about it was you were just waiting for Gonzaga to make their run. Cause like teams, even in the WCC on like those nights where Gonzaga isn't playing as hard just cause they don't have to against you right. know, Pepperdine's and the Pacifics of the world. That's mm-hmm. kind of what I thought was happening in the UCLA game. Just like, Hey, UCLA is playing really good. They're playing inspired. And Gonzaga, we were talking, Kendall and I were talking about it during the game. It's like Gonzaga hasn't made their run yet. They haven't made right. their run yet. And it turned into a historically good game. So I'm curious, yeah. where does that rank among the best tournament games you've seen? Just period. Period, yeah. I mean, you you look at, at the storylines, too, that, that are coming to that. You know, you have, you have a team like UCLA, one of the only teams uh, as an 11 seed to ever make the NCAA or uh, the Final Four. Um, you have a UCLA team who was projected uh, to finish – what was I don't know if it was last it was definitely um may have been last in the the Pac-12 if not last definitely bottom bottom third um you have a UCLA team with Mick Cronin who is a coach that usually had problems in March and a UCLA team who historically has been amazing uh in the tournament and so you had those UCLA storylines just as an individual team uh, you obviously had GU vying to be the first undefeated team national championship uh, winners since 76. Uh, a one, the, Probably, arguably, one of the most efficient offenses of all time uh, with the highest two-point uh, percentage in history in a very three-point centric era. Uh, you have a bona fide lottery pick, uh, arguably top maybe the top overall pick in Jalen Suggs, um, a Bulldogs team that is still going for his first national championship. I mean, the, the outside storylines coming into that game uh, already made it a very intriguing matchup um, outside of the fact that it's a 11 versus a one in a final four game, which you just don't see all that often. So we, yeah, when that game was going on, uh, I mentioned this earlier, it was very frustrating uh, as a GU fan because it just felt like that run was coming. um, (laughs) And it also was just, very unfortunate to watch UCLA do what they were doing. And that was making shots. Uh, Juzang, it doesn't count, but um, watching guys who usually wouldn't be knocking down all of these shots, just taking advantage of it. And it was shocking. And it was again, annoying. And you're just sitting there as a GU fan, like, Oh God, you know, here it comes. I mean, losing to Baylor in the national championship is one thing. Uh, Losing to 11th seeded UCLA team uh, who lost its final four games going into the late tournament, who had a pretty poor year 
overall and was far and away probably the worst team left in the tournament, even in the Sweet 16. Uh, and so it was about to be an upset that the entire country and world really uh, would never let GU live down. And so as the game was going on, it was building toward that. It was building. You could just feel it. You could feel that upset coming. You could feel that just mm -hmm. opportunity after opportunity for UCLA to just rip you, uh, GU fans' hearts out. And uh, it almost came multiple times. It, 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 there was – Right before Timmy took that charge, I'm thinking like, "Oh man!" I'm Ugh. like, "Here we go!" Like, I am, I'm, I'm going to go disappear. <laughs> like, if this, if this yeah. goes, in, nobody's <laughs> yep. ever going to see or hear of me again. Um, yep. <laughs> and so, like, like that, that play was was absolutely insane, and and it was the the 100 right call. I mean, it was it was the one of the more perfect charges you can ever see taken. I mean, it was it was clear as day. Um, and so that play happened and that made it wild. And before that, you had Suggs's block and his pass, which was absolutely insane. You had Corey Kispert throwing down a two-handed slam for a, you know, Corey Kispert's athletic, but you, that happened. And you're like, didn't know he could quite do that. Um, and just this back and forth and back and forth. Nobody up by more than four points, I think, in the last probably five minutes, uh, 10 minutes maybe uh, even. And so uh, ever, all of that just culminated to this ridiculous overtime where GU went up by six on three straight Timmy baskets, uh, two of them with his weaker left hand. And then at that point, you're like, all right, GU, here they go. Like they're taking advantage of the fact that uh, UCLA had a, had a couple turnovers. Johnny Juzang hasn't really touched the ball. And then you get to the fact that they're still up by five. And then all of a sudden they're up by two. And then you're like, okay, you know, we're still up. We're still up. That's fine. And then, uh, they make they make the their land and then or it's Juzang of all people you know uh, misses his floater it's short he grabs his own rebound because Kispert's not paying attention for whatever reason uh, Juzang lays it up and then you it's three point three seconds and I'm sitting there and I'm still trying to process was like they just tied the game up like are you are you serious right now and so I, I kind of like sat back like come on guys like what are you doing and then all of a sudden you see Sug streaking and you're like there's you know your, your brain's crossing this faster than you could ever talk and, and ever be able to explain what's going on and then all of a sudden you know Jalen's shooting like I mean he's in he's he's in a good shooting position I mean it was, it was a little bit of a runner but you could still see him square up his body before that shot uh came out of his hands and and that ball's in the air and you're like all right that shot looks pretty good and then it banks and for about six tenths of a second you just have no idea what's going on like you're like to and then, and then right when you, you were starting to question what happens, you're like, he just knocked down a buzzer beating shot in overtime to win the game. Like this is one of the most incredible shots of all time, far and away, yeah. probably the, the, one of the best shots of, of the final four and prior, uh, you know, obviously a buzzer beater national championship game winner just has to be better based off of the stakes. But that was yeah. one of the most incredible shots of all time. And that just put a nice fat bow on top of, of a massively entertaining yet albeit frustrating game for a Zag fan, uh, but a very exciting, exciting game. For sure. Yep. The, yeah, I, my house got you, pretty loud once that shot went yeah. in. <laughs> yep. The I way, didn't know what to do with myself when it went in. Yeah. No, I, the way you described it of like when it first went in and you, I, I it reacted the same way. Like I almost didn't process then it went in. Right. And yeah. then suddenly he's on the scores table and I'm like, wait, what? Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, he, even, even it's he over. <laughs> took him like a, a split second to react, you know, it went in and like, he kind of like turned and then he turned again and then started celebrating. Cause like, it's just, I mean, it was just, yeah, it was, it was bonkers. It was, uh, you know, the best way to go into a national championship game. Uh, and, you know, GU fans were on cloud nine and were so confident and, and everything was going really well. And, and then Baylor happened. So, I mean, it, it is what it is, but I'm, I'm glad they're at least able to get there uh, because that was the, it was championship or bust. Let's, let's, let's not forget that. Like this season was supposed yeah. to finish with the national championship, but second place is literally obviously and logistically the best you can do without actually winning it. So, I mean, it happens. Yeah. And it happens in the Pacific Northwest without fail. So what, right. what can we say? Right. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think this year's team, like take this roster and play it last year, do you think they win the national championship? Probably. Um, you know, we, we look at last year's really good teams. Baylor's up there again, not quite as dominant yeah. as, they, as they are this year. Um, you know, Kansas, Kansas would have been the toughest out. Uh, a GU-Kansas matchup wouldn't have surprised me. Uh, again, this – 
this team was very special in the sense that it wasn't just their pure skill. It wasn't just their pure athleticism. It wasn't, uh, and it, it had nothing to do with, with really their basketball. Obviously it had something to do with it, but the biggest factor for this team was just the way they were able to come together in a, in a very weird year. You know, uh, Jalen Suggs came in as a freshman in a COVID year. Uh, Andrew Nebhard came in like five days before the season tipped off, not came in, but was given the opportunity to actually play the season, even though he had been, you know, working and planning for to redshirt. And so, I mean, there were a lot of things that happened before the season that had to go that way. You know, uh, Kispert probably wouldn't have gone to the NBA. I mean, he could have. Um, but, you know, even Philip Petrusha of leaving was was instrumental um, in this in the fact that I don't think he would have fit on this team. Um, I don't either. I like him as a player. I enjoyed yeah. his time at GU, but he needed the ball and he wanted to score. And you could tell he got frustrated when he, when he didn't get the ball last year. And that was the most uh, a very interesting thing to see. You don't see that too often on GU teams. And then you, you, you get tossed this team and they're the most unselfish players ever, you know, sometimes made a, an extra one too many passes. And so yeah. um, I think last year's team would have probably fared a little bit better because they wouldn't have had to run into uh, a Baylor team of, of this year. Um, that was very, very frustrating to play against. Um, but I, uh, I also think this year's GU team, uh, would have beaten any iteration of, of GU teams prior uh, without too much of an issue. So heading into next year, uh, obviously we got Hunter Salas coming in, and it sounds like Gonzaga is the lead favorite for Chet Holmgren, the number one overall player. Uh, and then I've also seen in the hunt for Walker Kessler as well. Uh, I'm not sure of any other players right now off the top Those of my head ones, yeah. uh yeah. but how do you see the rotation yeah how do you see the rotation rounding out next year and l let's just assume for this sake that timmy comes back i guess we could do one with timmy coming back or one with timmy gone kind of how do you see the roster being next year i who's i was just talking to somebody about timmy um we'll start with him first because he's probably the largest question mark um before the tournament i would have been pretty darn confident he would have stayed I'm in, I'm in a very weird spot with him right now because he had a very, very good NCAA tournament. I mean, he broke uh, school records. He placed himself among other college greats with some of his stats. Uh, he did things that were really impressive this tournament. And obviously a lot of people's eyes are on this tournament. So I'd probably still lean toward Timmy staying um, probably like 65, 70% sure he's staying. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll assume he stays cause I, he needs a jump shot. He needs to get his shooting down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. that's, that's the only thing he yeah, needs. I, I mean, so he literally too. has everything else. Um, yeah. he's, he's tough enough. He's has decent size at six ten. Uh, he can maybe bulk up a hair, uh, and he has incredible footwork. You know, he reminds me a, a lot of a, let's see, of a very younger aged Montes Sabonis with that footwork. Uh, Sabonis mm -hmm. didn't really yeah, have a I jump shot. Too. He, he, he had a little bit of mid-range action, uh, which Timmy has a little bit, not, not as good as, as Sabonis uh, when he was here. But the footwork is there, the competitive fire, and the borderline cockiness. You know, Sabonis always had just that little bit of kind of – just felt like he was like shimmying a little bit. Like he just um, – without actually doing – like he just kind of, uh, you know, oozed confidence. And so – um, we'll, we'll say he comes back. So that's going to make it, uh, Nemhar's probably going to come back. Uh, I don't think he did enough to really show out, um, throughout the entire season. Now we could, I think he's, I think he's a solid rotational guard in the NBA if he continues to, uh, to grow. And he also could, could afford to put on a couple pounds. Um, so that if we get, if we go down the list here, that'll be Hunter Salas is going to be too good not to start. Uh, he's the highest rated recruit she's ever gotten. Um, even higher than Suggs. So that's that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, which is kind of wild to think yeah. about. Um, so you have Salas at the one uh, slash two. I mean, you also have to remember Salas. So Suggs came in. Suggs is 6'4", 205. Um, Salas is a little bit different. He's 6'5", 175. So he's a little bit taller, a little bit skinnier, um, but he can run the point. Let's just say Nebhardt at the one, actually. We'll put Salas at two. We'd probably see... Maybe a, a Dominic Harris at a two, Salas at a three. 
Um, and then you look at maybe even Watson slotting in there. Ayayi is another one of those guys that I could see staying. Um, he's kind of here in that second round um, action. God, there's they have so much talent. <laughs> and I haven't even said Chet Holmgren or Drew Timmy yet. Uh, it's going to be Drew Timmy. That'll probably that those are the easiest ones to lock down. You have Drew Timmy at the four um, and Holmgren at the five. Uh, I'm actually maybe even flip flop that since you know Holmgren can can work around the entire court. Um, but those two are your bigs. Yeah. If a Yai comes back, he's your three, and then you probably have a Nemhard Salas one, two action going on, uh, you know, then you're going to see a very large rotation then because you have Strother still coming in. You still have Cook, uh, sorry, not, uh, not Cook. You still have uh, Harris here. Um, you look at, at who else is here. You still have Watson, obviously. You still have Omar Ballo who's still here. Uh, I mean, they're going to have a, a very large rotation as long as they don't get hit with any transfers. You know, the guys who you're watching for are Lauskis, Zakharov to maybe transfer. People have mentioned Ballo to transfer. I, I don't see that at all. Uh, he's just so raw still because um, he has great size um, and great athleticism. He's just slow, um, still trying to understand the game. But you know, if I had to say right now with with the guys who I think who would, would be returning, you're gonna run. You're gonna run out there. Salas, Nemhard, Ayayi, Timmy, Chet Holmgren would be my guess with the rotation yeah. of Watson, Harris, and Strother. Uh, and then Ballo probably would be kind of that ninth guy coming in. So, I mean, you're looking at a, a, a deeper bench, a deeper ro rotation, and uh, a more athletic team um, looking at the fact that Salas is going to be able to do a lot of the things that Suggs did. Uh, Chad Holmgren is, you know, talked about as being kind of a unicorn, the fact that he can go anywhere uh, with also very good athleticism. Uh, and then obviously Strother and Harris are very athletic. Yai still, we've talked about his athleticism earlier, still an athletic guy. Anton Watson is still kind of growing into who he is as a college basketball player, I think. Um, the one thing that they're going to be having a question mark on, uh, which is the exact same thing they had this year, is probably just their shooting. You know, they're going to have a Yai. Chet luckily can shoot. I actually don't know too much about Salas as far as his jump shooting. I want to say it's very similar. He's a very similar player to Suggs, if I remember right. Um, he's a slasher more so more so than a straight up shooter, um, but he's going to be he's going to be really good and a very different player than Suggs because he has a six ten wingspan as a six five player. So he's he's wow. lanky. He's very very wow. lanky. It's a big dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's going to be fun to watch. For sure. Well, Justin, thanks for coming on tonight. We'll close it out with one question that we are going to start asking all of our guests. And it's not yeah. basketball related, but it's an important question. Deal. In your time on the road as a journalist, we'll mm -hmm. ask this in our future for our listeners. We'll ask this to players and coaches as well. In mm -hmm. your time on the road, best and worst meal you've had? I'm going to – Okay. Uh, my best, and this is kind of cheating, but I think it's appropriate. Um, my best meal was all of the meals I got for free when I was traveling for the school paper. That's a pretty um, good choice. So, I, I mean, I, I feel you so hard. Right. There. I mean, literally, it was, it, was, <laughs> it, it was everything. I mean, they, they literally yeah. had no restrictions. Their only restriction was no liquor. And it's like, I mean, that's fine. Um, they said, they said, yeah. uh, you can get whatever food, uh, from anywhere, um, we're here for it. So, I mean, we, we went to, we'd get dinner and we'd look up just fun dessert places and we'd go and get dessert every single night. We'd, uh, go to, um, fun places that we never would go normally, you know, we'd, we'd go to a sit down restaurant for dinner rather than going and getting fast food, unless we're going to in and out or something that's kind of unique to different areas. Um, so those were always good. The worst one that I ever had. Um, so I don't know if this was food related. I'm going to say it was. Um, it, uh, in 20, this whole COVID thing's got me thrown off with the tournaments. In 2019, when the Zags were in Salt Lake City um, for the first and second round, um, I was with, down there with my dad and uh, I was still down there coming for the spokesman. The spokesman didn't pay for anything. I only uh, got press passes in. And so we went to this uh, kind of local hot dog place and nothing crazy. I mean, um, just a, some sort of, uh, I don't remember exactly what kind of hot dog I got. Anyway, it was a hot dog place. And I woke up the next day, my dad felt fine. And I just felt so sick. And on the way back from, we drove to and from Salt Lake City. 
we drove back from Salt Lake City. I probably threw up and I don't throw up. I'm not, I'm not a guy who has stomach problems like ever. I probably threw up 15 times in a, in oh, a, uh, oh. <laughs> That's an, in a, an eight hour span. I mean, literally every, almost every 30 minutes I was, was puking in the car and, uh, it was, it was the weirdest thing. I have no idea what it was. Um, I got home and I, I went to my parents and stayed the night there because I was out of liquids in my body and I was literally hunched <laughs> over the entire time. So when we got back to my parents' house, I couldn't move. Like my entire body was, was one cramp. Like I literally was the worst cramped pain I've ever felt. And I had to be like helped and like almost borderline carried into the house. Cause I just had no fluid left in my body. Um, so that was the worst. Uh, and I blame that hot dog yeah. place. If, is it their fault? I'm not sure, but I'm going to go with it. Uh, to check the question right. and, uh, the fact that, um, they ruined my, uh, my trip back home. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a worthy inclusion. I guess that's a quick impress. one way trip to never eating a hot dog again. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. Uh, that that was uh, <laughs> that was unfortunate for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Justin, for coming on. You can check out this episode. Well, actually, after this, we're going to add on a segment to this podcast episode talking about the Pac-12. Full disclosure, we did record it before the final four game with UCLA, but we have a good discussion with John on there about um, the Pac-12 teams that made the tournament. Check us out, Spotify. Um, and YouTube. We'll get this episode up here in the next couple of days. Uh, thanks again for listening, everyone. Thanks for having me.